Let's give it up for the band leading us in worship today. When that bumper plays, does anybody else feel like it's like almost like an Avengers movie there at the end? Does anybody feel that? Like, I just want to be Captain America one Sunday. Um, but uh, we started a new series a couple of weeks ago called Old Made New. We're going to continue with that today and uh, a little bit of flavor uh, today from our Uprising Men's Conference that's coming up in two weeks. We are super excited about that. And... Um, Last weekend, or uh, last Sunday, I believe it was, we had our men's worship night. Was that last Sunday? Okay. Uh, seems like everything is like three weeks away, four weeks away. Anyway, um, we had an amazing night of worship, and it was exciting. If you didn't make it out, please make sure you make it to the next one. Um, today's sermon is going to be entitled, You Were Not Intended to Walk Alone. You Were Not Intended to Walk Alone. And the basis of this message is going to come out of uh, a proverb, but before we get to that, in Genesis chapter 2, before Genesis chapter 3, Genesis chapter 3, man sins, fallenness occurs, curse upon mankind, death is introduced into the, the, the discussion, sickness, all those things that are plague our world today, whenever you get frustrated, whenever you feel pain, all a result of fallenness before that problem existed. Because we'd be tempted to say all of our problems are a result of sin. What if I told you that in Genesis chapter 2, after five days of creation, in the sixth day, God says he created man, and even though every other day was good and it was perfect, he said there's something that wasn't good. There was something that wasn't good on day two, on the sixth day of creation. Do you know what that was? It was not good for man to be? Man, so good, so good. It was not good for man to be alone. So before man ever sinned, he had a problem. And the God said that it wasn't good for him to be alone. Whenever we walk alone, it is never good. It is never good for any man, for any woman, for any person to ever walk alone. God did not intend for us to walk alone. And yet, when we see the problems that arise in our lives, I will guarantee you, it usually stems from us walking alone. Now, you say, well, Tim, I'm with other people all the time. You can be here and not here, right? You can be at home and not at home, right? You, it, just because you're around people doesn't mean that you're locked in. doesn't mean that you are focused. And so your attention is other places. Some people, they're, they're going through the motions of marriage, but they're not present, right? They're at work, but have you guys ever seen someone that's on the job, but they are not working hard? Has anybody ever seen this? Like, you know, like they're there. I mean, they're getting paid, right? Uh, but, but are they working hard? I don't know if they're work, hardly working. Anyway, um, so... So whenever we think about this concept of man being alone, I think that a lot of times it's in our minds that men oftentimes like to live in isolation. We tend to isolate. That's just the nature of our being is to isolate. You just want to be left alone. I just want to be left alone. Is anybody else like, is there any men that are like that in there? Yes. Yeah. I just, let's, I just want to go home and sit down and just leave me alone. You know, that's, that's a lot of men. And so um, there's a mistake in that mentality, right? There's a mistake in that methodology from a spiritual perspective. And I hope that I, hope that I can answer a couple of questions today. Um, as our uprising conference is coming up, I know, you know some are prohibited from making it because of uh, scheduled events. I get that. Uh, but the ones of you that are on the fence and you're wondering like, eh, would it be good? Is it really going to make a difference if I'm there or not? I hope I can make the case today, and then you can decide if you want to arrange your schedule. It's good for us to get alone and get away and have God shape us, and this is the only weekend out of the year that we offer this opportunity, and I will guarantee you that your work is not offering you this opportunity to be honed, to be shaped, to be encouraged, to be sharpened. And so as I preach today, I'm going to share three stories in the Bible of men that did not walk alone. And as a result of them not walking alone, incredible things happened. And I want us to look at the antithesis of that to say what would happen if they did walk alone. What would ha how would the story have been different had these men 
walked alone. In Proverbs 27, 17, this is our anchor verse for today. It says, iron sharpens iron, and one man sharpens another. Iron sharpens iron, and one man sharpens another. Have you guys ever just, I know the odds of us having a blacksmith in the room is not good, but have you ever seen in a movie someone like, cranking on some irons. Anybody ever seen this, right? Like the guy with a hammer, you can imagine it. He's like got a, this anvil and they've heated up this piece of metal and now he's going to shape it and he's like, wham, you know, wham. And the only way for iron to be sharpened or to be shaped is through pressure, through heat, and through friction. And so when it says that as iron sharpens iron, so does one man sharpen another, that is not a pleasant process, right? It's not a pleasant process. If, if you are a typical person, we do not invite critique into our lives. We, matter of fact, we try to avoid critique. We try to avoid conflict oftentimes. And whenever it comes to being sharpened, how will you ever be sharpened if you're not putting yourself in position to receive that direction, right? As a matter of fact, every Sunday, I look at it like, you know, I know I'm a pastor, but I, I really look at it more like I'm a coach, right? My job is to coach you so that you can succeed when you go out there, so that you can be light in a dark world, right? Can, so you can be salt, so that people can see your life and they might see Christ and then they want Christ and as a result of them wanting Christ, their marriage changes, their life changes, the, the kingdom is impacted, other lives are brought to Christ. All of these things happen as a result of the principles that we preach out of God's word. And so as we preach that, I just want you to begin thinking like as iron sharpens iron, you got to put yourself in position in order to receive that, right? Like if you're not creating community in your life, man, natural man, sinful man, fallen man is prone to isolation. As a matter of fact, we see the first two sons that were ever created. It was uh, Cain and what was the other guy's name? Anybody? Abel, right? Cain and Abel. And Abel's sacrifice was acceptable to God and Cain's was rejected. And he allowed his jealousy to get out of control. Anger took over. The enemy pounced. And all of a sudden, he killed his own brother. Because there's something inside of us that has a, there's a, there's a rage, there's an anger, there's a destructive force that's inside of every man. We, we tend to get jealous. We tend to get angry when praise goes somebody else's way. You remember when, when David and Saul, like David slew Goliath and all of a sudden songs were being sung and it wasn't that Saul didn't get any credit, it was that he didn't get as much credit. And he didn't have a problem with it. It wasn't like he was sitting in his castle with his crown on his head, sitting around thinking like, I wonder if David's getting more praise than me, right? It's like almost as if the thought didn't enter his mind until he heard the people saying it. And as soon as he heard the praise not going his way, it infected his mind. And now he began to look at David differently. Isn't it amazing when our mind begins to walk alone, that it always tends to devolve into dark places. It tends to move into these places where I'm, I'm now paranoid. <laughs> I'm now angry. I'm now jealous. I'm now allowing my flesh to overcome my spirit. And the only antidote to that is God's word, God's presence, and God's people. And so you have to not walk alone, else you fall into the enemy's traps. Fair enough? So let's preach it. Are you guys ready? Say amen. Yeah. All right. That was not the best amen. I just want you to know, like, I don't know if you guys are ready for this. So we're going we're gonna to charge extra unless you guys get better at this, okay? Um, so number one. So every one of these we're going to see how it would be if the old way was what we were using. The old way inside of all of us, seeks to build without inviting the voice of God. In 2 Kings chapter 6, there was an interesting expansion opportunity. There was a young prophet that came to the lead prophet named Elisha. And Elisha was like Yoda to all the young Jedis for all the Star Wars people in here. By the way, 
Um, we're getting to that age range where some generations have not seen Star Wars. So just out of curiosity, how many people have never seen a Star Wars in here? Wow. Okay, we're going to have a Star Wars watch night. <laughs> So he goes to Yoda and he says, hey, we've run out of room. There's the, we got to expand. There's not enough places here for all the young prophets that are coming up. Would you mind if we went down to the Jordan River, we cut down some trees, and we just, you know, expanded the building? And he was like, yeah, no problem. And now it says at the end of verse 2, he said, go. And then at the beginning of verse 3, it says that one of the young prophets decided to invite Elisha. And they were like, hey... Would, would it please you to go with us? And he said, yeah, yeah, I'll go. And so he invited the man of God. He invited the voice of God. You could even say, because the prophet of God was the presence of God in the Old Testament, he invited the presence of God. So they went down to the river and they started chopping trees. And lo and behold, right? <laughs> lo and behold, in mid-swing, dude, axe head flies off into the water. And the guy freaks out. He says, alas, my master, it was borrowed like, what, what can I do? And the man of God comes over. He's like, where did you lose it? And he's like, right here. And the guy goes and cuts a stick off a tree. Now, this is not physics, all right? If you do this at home, the scientific experiment, this will not work. This is the power of God. He throws the stick in the water. The ax head made of iron floats up, and he returns, and the guy picks it up, and now he has his ax head. So I began to think about that, and I thought, how many men go out there to build, and they want to build alone. They fail to invite the voice of God, and I guarantee you everyone in here knows this is true. If you have started anything in your life, did it go exactly the way you expected it to go, or did inevitably the unexpected take place? For instance, when you got married, did that go exactly the way you thought it was going to go? No. If you started a business in here, how many people have ever started a business in here? By show of hands. Okay, a lot of you. Did that go exactly the way you thought that was going to go? I bet during COVID it didn't go the way you thought it was going to go. I guarantee you it didn't. So, so if you had children, did that go exactly like, oh yeah, like it's a dream. Just slept through the night every night. It was beautiful. No, it did not. Nothing, it, listen, nothing in life goes purely as expected. So you should be even get to the point where you could expect the unexpected if you intend to expand, okay? And expansion is great, growth is great, building is great, but make sure you invite the voice of God. Because what happens when you get out there and the guy's swinging the ax, swinging the ax, and all of a sudden he goes and it goes flying off there. Imagine he didn't have the voice of God. How is, could he go cut a stick off, throw it in the water and make an ax head float and come back to him? No, he could not do that. So therefore he would have lost something that he couldn't retrieve all because he wanted to expand without inviting the voice of God. Do I even have, do I even have to preach this? Because everybody, everybody see where I'm going here? Like, what if you're the guy that's out there trying to expand without the voice of God? What if you were single one day and you found someone that was going to be nice enough to marry you and, and you proposed and they said yes, and now you're going to expand. You're going to go from one to two, right? And I'm going to tell you in that expansion, you better invite the voice of God. And then when you say we're going to go from two to three and a new little one is going to come into the fray, you better invite the voice of God. When you decide what you're going to do for the rest of your life, what has God opened the door? What has he called you to, right? Then you better invite the voice of God. Otherwise, imagine working out there in the world for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years doing something that God never intended for you to do. You think that'd be frustrating? See, I hate it because I know that a lot of us, we just repeat the same cycles over and over and over. 
and over. Tell me this isn't true. Needlessly, oftentimes, needlessly, I'll give you an example. If I'm lying, I'm dying. Everybody in here, one of you, if you're married, is a cover hog, a blanket hoarder, all right? This is true. This is true in every relationship, okay? And in my relationship, it is my beloved. She's, she's right here. Now, you don't know this until after you're married. And she's what I call a burrower. She burrows. And I don't even know what she's trying to burrow down into, but she starts like kind of twisting as she goes to sleep. And she's a narcolept, so she's out quick, but she's still capable of movement and talking, which newlywed, that's weird when someone <laughs> straight up, one time she stood up, set up in the bed and she sang Little Orphan Annie, the sun will come out tomorrow. That'll trip you out, all right? So she will roll, all right? She'll roll up in the blanket, right? Now I'm faced with this task, almost like, you know, Mission Impossible MacGyver, that I gotta try to unroll her because I want blanket, right? Without awakening the beast, right? Now she'll yell at me when I pull this blanket. It's not her. Sweet Carrie is not talking anymore. It's Sleep Carrie. Sleep Carrie is talking. So I grab this blanket. She's like, "What are you doing?" You know, and then just, you know, it's right back. She won't even know that this happened. But it's fear. Like, right? You're like trying to defuse a bomb. Anybody else know what I'm talking about? Say amen, right? And so, so we went through this dance. I don't know. I don't know. Ten years. Ten years of marriage doing the same thing over and over again. And then one day I thought to myself, how about, how about a two blanket, how about a two blanket solution? A two blanket solution. I have my blanket, you have your, why do we have to have the same blanket? Who wrote that? Who wrote that in the rules? And I just wonder how many people going through 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years of the same cycle could be solved in an instant. Nobody told me in premarital, go to two blankets, Tim. It'll save your marriage. No one tells you that kind of stuff in seminary. So all I'm trying to do is help you. I am Coach Tim in here today. You are going through cycles over and over again that could be avoided with the simplest of changes. Invite the voice of God. Invite the voice of God. Before you expand, before you build, before you head down to the river, as all men and, and all women in here, you wake up on Monday and it's time to go out and chop the wood. And we all love, in Frisco, man, we are expanders, okay? And so we want to build the next building. We want to, you know, conquer the next dragon. Anyway, you want, you're wanting to do this, but did you take the time to invite the voice of God? Because I think a lot of people got out of college and you started running. You started chopping. And then you got out there and something unexpected happened. And you lost something. And because you didn't invite the voice of God, how do you get it back now? I've seen believers that lost their passion. I've seen marriages that lost their intimacy. I've seen parents that lost their children. I've seen it all. And these are good people, well-intended people. It was a good thing. Expansion was a good thing. But expansion without the voice of God. Man, expect the unexpected. The great thing about inviting the voice of God to show the contrast is that if you don't have the voice of God, you're going to lose things that you would have kept. But the great thing about inviting the voice of God is that he says literally this morning to you, if you're going through a season of loss, if you're going through a season of unexpected, show me where you lost it. Isn't that great? God's like, show me, just, just show me where you lost it. And then he does something amazing, throws it in there, and it, God is able to raise things. God is able to find things. God is able to find things for you that you can never find for yourself. Why do you need to have the voice of God in your life? Because you're going to lose some things along the way, and they're going to be impossibly lost, that you do not have the strength, you don't have the intellect, you don't have the power to bring them back. But if you would invite the voice of God, watch what my God can raise up that you've lost in here this morning. Yes, yes, yes. Do not. 
Do not build alone. Number two, number two, the old way desires to climb the mountain alone. Man, I don't know when we learned it, how we learned it, but in America, we have some great components. We have some great components. I mean, the ability to be self-reliant and self-determinate, those are, those are incredibly important things. I just think that they're very dangerous absent the presence of God, absent other people in our lives. And there's a great story in Exodus chapter 17 where Moses is developing a battle plan. And this battle plan is going to be a little eccentric in the sense that he said there's this king named Amalek, and Amalek was the enemy. And they were going to go out to battle the next day. And Moses said, Joshua, you're going to go fight in the valley. However, I'm going to take my brother Aaron and my friend Hur, H-U-R. Um, it's similar to like a boy named Sue. And so I'm going to take Aaron and I'm going to take Hur, and we're going to go on the top of this hill, this mountain. And we are going to intercede up there for you while you fight down there. And so as they woke up the next day, they ascended up the mountain. And when the battle began, and a crazy thing occurred. Moses had this insight. He says that while his hands were lifted high, he had the rod of God in his hand. And this rod was the same rod he, he smote the sea with and the Red Sea parted, the same one he threw down for the Egyptians and it turned into a snake. He took it back up again in his hand. I mean, this rod became prolific. He was rested in the ark of God for all time. Anyway, it's just it's an incredible story about this rod that God used to do all these things. And so he's holding it in the air, and I'm sure to some degree, if you ever held anything long enough, right? Has anybody ever, it's like, anybody ever like tried to do a press and you're like, he's like trying to hold it? Has anybody ever planked? You want to look like an idiot, you just hold a plank as long as you can, and your body starts to do something, right, that is involuntary. Has anybody ever gone through this process? Everyone that's ever exercised, your, what does your body start doing? What does it start doing? Tell, you start doing this, right? You're just like, and you, you, you look like an idiot. No one looks cool like this. No one's ever like, yeah, I want that, you know? You know? Here is Moses up on this mountain, and while his hands are in the air, it says, down there in the valley, Joshua and the army of Israel, they were winning. It says, but then his hands grew weary. And it says that when his hands began to lower, they started losing in the valley. Man, if I want to help someone in here today, I think I'm going to help someone. Do not climb alone. Do not climb alone. Because Moses was well-intentioned. He was good. He was godly. But what if he had walked? What if he had climbed up that mountain alone? Because you know what is certain? That if you hold your hands up long enough, you will grow weary. Every person in here, when you begin your race, when you launch, let's say, at 18, out there into the wilderness, you know, out there into the wild, you know, you are strong, right? You're ready. But if I tell you to hold your hands up long enough, at some point, right, it doesn't matter how good you are. It doesn't matter how godly you are. It matters only do you have someone there to hold up your hands? Because if you climb alone, there's going to come a moment where you get weary. Has anyone ever gone through a season where you got weary? Say amen. Like, like you might, some of you are weary. Just look at your faces in here this morning. You, you look weary. I'm just letting you know. Like, like you're going through a weary, like you have good intentions. You might even be godly, but like your hands are starting to come down. And as your hands begin to come down, it says that there was something connected, something, there's like a spiritual thing going on where what happens on the mountain determines what happens in the valley. And, and imagine this, some people will lose as a result of your isolation. When you live in isolation, when you climb in isolation, when your mind is in isolation, when you are present but you are not there, when you're here on Sunday but you're not here, it said that there was a cost. There was a cost to the people in the valley. 
that if Moses climbed alone, well, what happens to Joshua? Joshua would have lost. Do you know we have a whole book named Joshua? And if Moses would have climbed alone, we don't have that story. Do you know that Joshua led the people into the promised land? If Moses walks alone, we don't. Do you understand how it's chained together? That the mountain is important? And Moses picked two of his trusted allies to walk with him up the mountain? And they cared so much that they says that they were like, do you have some friends that are aloof? Does anybody have some friends that like, they are aloof. Would you, anybody like, you know who your friend is? Do you have a name that comes to your mind? They're aloof, right? They, they don't even notice, right? They don't, like a bomb goes off. They don't even notice, right? And here they're looking and like they're seeing, and I don't know if Moses is like, hey, hey, guys, I'm getting tired. I'm getting, I don't know what, I don't know what happened. All I know is they said, let's get him a rock, you know, so he can have something to sit on so he can steady himself. And then his hands still grew weary. And it says that one of them stood on either side and literally a man was holding another man's arm up so that the battle could be won down in the valley. And I started thinking about that. I said, how can we make that? How can we bring that home? What if every man was supposed to go up the mountain for his family? And what if that man good intentioned, even godly, decides I'm going to go up the mountain alone. I will try in my own strength. And I bet there's some men in here that are trying with all their might to hold it together. Just, just, man, I'll just make it through this season. Make it, I'm, but my hands are getting weary. And you haven't invited anyone else into your process. You haven't invited anybody else to climb with you. You haven't invited anyone else that takes note of when you are weary. And as a result, when you get up there, I just wonder how many, how many losses are going on for your family in the valley because you as a man are unwilling to allow the old to be made new. A new way of living. A new way of climbing. Instead of doing it all by yourself that God intended for you to invite other people into your process. Let's look at the comparison. You see, you will lose battles. You could have won. And if you invite others, if you allow the iron to sharpen the iron, man, you're going to win battles that you would have lost. And every week, I want to lift up your hands. That's what I want to do. We want to create a culture where other people will lift other people up so that they can win. So your family can win when they're out there in the valley. You are never intended to expand alone. You are never intended to climb alone. And then lastly, you are never intended to fight alone. It says in 2 Samuel chapter 21, King David, who we started off the message with, it says, once again, there was a battle between the Philistines and Israel. David went down with his men to fight against the Philistines, and he became exhausted. We're going to say that on the count of three. One, two, three, exhausted. So Moses grew weary. David became exhausted. These were great men. Great men, all great men, eventually get tired. And who was waiting but the enemy, for David to grow weary, for David to get exhausted. It says in verse 16 that Ishbi Binab, all right? What a name, right? There's, there's an Ishbi Binab for every person in here that's just waiting, just waiting on you to get tired, just waiting on you to take a wrong step. We all got an Ishbi issue that we are working on this morning. It says that one of the descendants of Rapha, whose bronze spearhead, Weighed 300 shekels, just saying that this dude was a stud, a Hulk Hogan type of individual who was armed with a new sword. And what did he say as soon as he saw weakness in David? I'm going to kill him. Verse 17, it says, but Abishai, one of David's mighty men, came to David's rescue and he struck the Philistine down and killed him. We need men willing to watch our backs in the middle of the melee. Now I have to take you through my spiritual imagination 
to set this scene and drive this home and close this message. How many of you have ever seen the movie Gladiator? By show of hands, Gladiator, okay. Uh, there's another one with Mel Gibson. Uh, Braveheart, right? Let other people have a chance, right? I was just giving them a chance. I know the movie. <laughs> David is out there fighting, and to me, it's just like a scene in Gladiator, but this is real. You know, Gladiator's a movie, you know that? This story is real. And David's out there, and you can see him, right? He's just mowing down enemy after enemy. Just incredible warrior. And you can see him, though, like he swings, and every man has so many swings to the sword, right? And he swings, and he slays one enemy, and then it's like he takes that step back. It's like a it's weariness. Like when you get tired, you it's like things don't work the way they're, you know, it's like your legs don't work. You get that jelly feeling and, and the, the breathing starts to be labored. And there was this moment where David had given all that he had. And all of a sudden he was exhausted. And it says that the enemy saw, like imagine there's thousands of people fighting in a fight. And yet Ishbi, Benob, was looking at David. And the enemy is just waiting. Can I tell you this morning, some of you, because you walk alone, the enemy is waiting, is waiting, just waiting for you to take that false step, just waiting for you to become labor, just waiting for you to become exhausted. And then they're going to look for their opportunity to take you out. And I just imagine Ishbi Benob seeing David across the battlefield, growing exhausted, and he's running, right? In my mind, he's running at David. He has his sword drawn, and he lifts it up, and right when he's getting ready to swing it down, Abishai, out of nowhere, wham, lops off his head. I know, gory. But in my mind, that's the way it happened, okay, folks? And I imagine how big David's eyes were, right? That he got that close. That close. I liken that into when you're driving down the road and your spouse has fallen asleep and you kind of get lulled into that false sense of like maybe you're drifting, maybe you just focused on something and all of a sudden something pops up and you bobble and it startles them. Has anybody ever had this happen? Like you're like, you're like, oh, and then they wake up, you're like, huh, and then you like act like, <laughs> no, what? Has anybody else, like, something, you're, King David was that close to dying, and he was the greatest warrior of all time. The only thing that kept him from not writing the rest of Psalms, the only thing that kept him from becoming a footnote, instead of the one who builds Sets aside the materials for Solomon to build the temple of God. All the things that are connected to David are wrapped up in this moment. You ever thought about that? He would have died if he was on his own. The only reason why he lived is because he realized, I'm not supposed to fight alone. I need to inspire other men to fight with me. I need to inspire other men to fight for me. I need to inspire other men to fight beside me. And as a result of his intelligence that he had done the spiritual calculus that I am not intended to go to battle alone, that day he lived. Now, if we take that into consideration, we put the comparison up on the board. Why do we need to not fight alone? Because you will die when you could have lived. Versus David lived when he should have died. Do you think it matters if you're fighting out there alone? Can you imagine a marriage that's on the rocks and someone is fighting alone? Can you imagine a parent who has a child that is far from God and instead of inviting other people to pray and encourage, that they're just hoping alone? Can you imagine when the money gets so bad that you're having to decide which bill you're going to pay and you're enduring it alone? You know what the enemy will always do? He'll always invite you to be alone. He will always invite you into isolation. 
And they'll say, oh, you'll be embarrassed. You know how embarrassed you'd be if, if people knew that you were normal? If people knew that you were a sinner just like them, if people know that you had made this terrible mistake, he'll always trick you into saying like, don't keep it a secret. Keep it a, don't tell anyone, keep it a secret. Because if you can keep it a secret, then he can keep you in prison. And you'll die when you should have lived. Now, if you start inviting people to join you in the journey, join you in the fight, Invite the voice of God when you decide to expand and build. Invite the voice of God when you go up on the mountain. Then you'll have people there that in the midst of the battle, Abishai is fighting his own fight. And yet he has an eye on his king. He has an eye on his friend. And he's watching out for him even though he's in the middle of his fight. I can't think of a better way to preach this and what I'm preaching it to you now. Do you have men in your life that are fighting their fight but love you enough that they have an eye on you? That when you're on the edge, when you're exhausted, they come running to your rescue. You see, this is what my fear is. My fear is that in this North Dallas, Frisco, I don't know, crazy, weird universe that we live in, the Cowboys have moved here, the PGA has moved here, and I think Toyota has moved here. I don't know how many people have moved here. Disney apparently heard about Frisco and Genesis Metro, and they were like, let's put a church beside, or uh, sorry, a uh, theme park beside their church. Anyway, all the things that are happening. This is just a crazy world. And I fear that this is the mentality of the average person. Even I'll make it specific. The average man. I've conquered. I've risen. I've built. And now the rest of my life is dedicated to enjoying the spoils of my labor. Can I tell you what a falsity that is? God did not lift David to just enjoy the fruits of being king. He did not lift Elisha just to be the prophet of God. He did not lift Moses up just to enjoy the power of having the presence of God in his life. No. The goal was you are blessed. And in this area, blessed beyond your wildest imagine from when you were a kid to where you most likely are blessed beyond what you ever thought you would be. Now, is that just for you? Or are you blessed to bless? If you've went to the mountaintop and someone lifted your hands and you won, isn't the goal then to go find some other man and lift up his hands so that his family can win, to take them around the bases, so that they can score the run, so that they can hit the home run, so that they can score the... Isn't the goal to repeat the cycle for as many people as you possibly can? And yet I fear that Christianity has become a consumer mindset to where I have my God, I have my Jesus, I've been to the mountaintop, I've won the battle, and now just let me recline. Man, what if you thought about it like this, that every week we come in here, there's people down there in the valley that are fighting for their lives, fighting for their existence. And if you don't go up on top of that mountain and take someone with you, they're going to lose. Another soul lost, another marriage lost, another teenager decided that the world loved them more than... Mm, Today I hope that you would appreciate we want to create a culture where men do not walk alone. And the ones that have won the rest of their lives, all they want to do is show other men how to win. And you can't do that if you live in isolation. Something to ponder today. Something to ponder. Does your calculus need to be corrected? Let me pray for you. Father, we ask... In the name of Jesus, 
If someone has lost something in here today, God, that you have the ability to raise it. God, I pray that every family would invite you to join them in their journey. Join them as they build. I pray that they would invite other men, other couples, other Christians in authentic community to walk with them, to climb with them up the mountain, to fight with them when the enemy is in opposition. That God, they would know that there's a place that when they are exhausted and when they are weary, that they could walk into this house, that they could find community that's going to lift them up and encourage them to bear their burdens. But I also pray for those that are healthy and whole, that they might not consume that blessing, but they might realize, God, it's for, it's for someone else who is struggling in the valley. Today as you worship, I want you to consider you are worshiping your God who is your creator. But I like to think of it as I'm worshiping also for my brother that's in the valley. That if I can go up to the mountaintop and lift my hands, that maybe, maybe today my worship is what helps set them free. It'll change the way you worship, won't it? It's not just for you. It's for God. And it's for the people in the valley. Would you guys stand and join us?